Exodus 1.8 There arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Israel had remained a separate race from the Egyptians and had grown and prospered to such an extent that they were viewed as a potential enemy nation right in the midst of Egypt. But the Pharaoh didn't want to banish the Israelites because they were skilled craftsmen adding great wealth to the nation. By oppressing them with the bondage of hard labor, he sought to subdue them and crush their spirit. When this failed, the king then sought to decrease their number by issuing a decree that every Hebrew male born alive was to be cast into the river and drowned. It was at this time that Moses was born and hid by his mother in an ark of bulrushes placed in the river and rescued by the Pharaoh's own daughter. Raised as the Pharaoh's grandson, he was considered part of the royal family, but his loyalties remained with his own people. When Moses killed an Egyptian for smiting a fellow Hebrew, he incurred the wrath of his adopted grandfather, the Pharaoh, and he fled Egypt to Midian. There he married the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian, a worshiper of the true creator. Forty years later, he was called of God at the burning bush to lead his now enslaved people out of Egypt. The rest of the story is well known, but the apparent lack of any evidence has led scholars to either doubt the truth of the entire story, to try to downplay the events and explain them in terms of natural science, or explain them as normal events which were blown out of proportion. Ron Wyatt believed they occurred exactly as the Bible stated. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. When the people were given the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God told them, For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. This scripture clearly told Ron that they left Egypt that very day, and that Succoth was outside of Egypt proper. Moses had asked to take the people three days' journey out of the land of Egypt to worship the true God. But by the command of God, Moses knew they would not return. He had been in Midian when he had seen the burning bush and had been called by the Lord to deliver his people out of bondage. And though he had been told he would lead them to the promised land, they were first to come to Mount Sinai. For God had told him, Exodus 3.12, this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. So from Succoth they set out from Midian and Mount Sinai. Exodus 13:17, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. The Philistines lived along the coasts. Throughout known history, the desolate peninsula located between the two fingers of the Red Sea has remained uninhabited except for small isolated groups of Bedouin. And this desolate and forbidding region was quite reasonably called in the biblical account the wilderness of the Red Sea. When they arrived at Etham, in the edge of the wilderness, they had almost reached the northern tip of the arm of the Red Sea called the Gulf of Aqaba. But it was here that God had another plan for his people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. Had they continued their present course, they would have soon reached safety. But instead they turned south and entered into a massive group of mountains that were without escape. The winding eighteen mile long canyon, today called Wadi Watir, twisted towards the seashore, at times less than 100 feet wide. Once they arrived at the sea, they encamped, but in great fear, for here they certainly felt trapped. It is also about eight miles across from the beach at Nueva. 
The few bathymetric maps Ron was able to find showed that the depths from the Nueva beach to the opposite shore reached a maximum of about 900 feet, gently sloping, while on each side there were sheer drops to about 5,000 feet. There certainly appeared to be an underwater path which could have been traveled with the water removed. When Ron and the boys first came to Nueva, they went to the south end of the beach. He and the boys then donned their scuba gear and began to investigate what may lie beneath the waters of the crystal clear gulf. On the first dive, Ron found chariot wheels preserved by the coral which had attached to it. He found an axle with portions of each wheel still present. These chariot wheels were very difficult to see and recognize because they are covered in coral, and the portions that were not covered have disintegrated. In February of 1988, he found this gold four-spoke chariot wheel in the same general area. There is no coral on the main part of the wheel because coral doesn't attach to gold. Only around the hub area where some wood was exposed when it came off the chariot. Okay, we're out here at the beach that the Israelites came out on when they came out of the canyon system that they had been following by the leading of the cloud and of course following Moses who was following the cloud and they came out on this beach and proceeded to the south which is this direction there was an old Egyptian fortress up to the left Piharoth, and so they turned southward, and of course the cloud turned southward, and that was what they were following. Now the canyon, or wadi, as they're referred to in this part of the world, extends back through the mountains here, and is never less than about 75 feet in width. And, uh, of course, it's almost a direct line from ancient Sukkoth, where they left, into this area. This is the mouth of the canyon. While today we see a modern, fairly modern highway, here when they came out they saw nothing, of course. As the Egyptian host approached them, expecting to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites and descended between them and the armies of Egypt. A wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and their pursuers. The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews and they were forced to halt. But as the darkness of night deepened, the wall of cloud became a great light to the Hebrews, flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of day. Then hope returned to the hearts of Israel, and Moses lifted up his voice unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore crowest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea.